Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Kimberly Alvari, R.D. Kimberly Alvari is a registered dietitian and the food service director at Washington Hospital. Kimberly received her undergraduate degree from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo and completed her graduate work at the University of California, San Francisco. She is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, I am excited to be here today because um, this is a real opportunity for registered dietitians in terms of celiac disease because the only treatment for celiac disease is the diet. So this is my domain. Um, I, it's a subject that I'm very fond of. I speak often about it. I often um, do all the uh, hospital training for pharmacists, uh, the uh, speech therapists, anybody in the hospital nursing. I've done a lot of training on this topic. And we really run the kitchen in the hospital um, in the way that I'm going to be describing to you and the special processes that we go through our patient, for our patients here at the hospital. So I'm glad you're able to um, attend. Um, I will, I think the talk will take maybe about 50 minutes. At the end, I'll uh, be able to entertain any questions that you may have um, in relations to um, celiacs. Okay, so the objectives for today is I'd like to define what celiac disease is. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there, so I really want to give you a description of what we're talking about. Um, identify the treatment. I already kind of gave you a clue that it's going to be dietary, um, and that's the main and only treatment. Um, attempt to define for you what does gluten-free mean when you see that, um, and what does that mean in terms in relation to the disease process itself. Um, help you identify gluten in foods. How do you, how do you know if it has gluten or not? Um, explain the importance of avoiding cross-contamination. I'm going to explain all of that to you. So that's basically our trip we're going to take today as we get through today's lecture. So what is celiac disease? It's actually an inherited autoimmune disorder, okay? So it's genetically inherited. Um, it's a permanent sensitivity to gluten um, to people who have this genetic um, disposition. Um, and what is gluten, okay, because that word's really popular today. But gluten is actually a structural protein called prolamines. It's a building, made up of building blocks of, a, of amino acids. And it's that sensitivity to those particular structural proteins, the proteins that give structure to like when you think of bread, why does the bread have the structure it has, um, that cause problems for people who have celiac disease, okay? How, how common is it? It seems like it's getting more common, and I'll tell you a little bit why that is. But basically, one out of every 266 people in the world have celiac disease. That's about 1% of the worldwide population. Um, if you have a relative with it, because I said it's a genetic disposition, your chances of inheriting the disease go up. So you can see that here, one in 22 or one in 39. Overall, though, for those in America, about uh, 3 million people have celiac disease currently. Um, that's one in about every 133 people. Um, and the number is climbing um, because of the uh, development in terms of testing and the education, just like this that's gone on to bring awareness to the disease. They actually expect maybe a tenfold increase in diagnosis um, in the next several years. It is the most common and chronic intestinal inflammatory disease there is. It is the most misdiagnosed um, bowel disease. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more how that happens. The average time it takes for someone who has celiac disease to diagnosis is usually about 11 years, okay? So you can see that 
with the education that's coming, they're going to expect to see more of that. But you can see there's a lot of people who've had the disease for a long time um, that finally are just getting diagnosed at this point. Okay. Given the fact that celiac disease is actually genetically inherited, what they've been able to see is there's other types of conditions that are genetic in disposition, and they actually see those linked to celiac disease. And one of the ones that's most common is if someone has type 1 diabetes. So if you have type 1 diabetes, the chances of you actually having celiac disease goes way up. And what they actually recommend for people if, you're, if you are a newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic, that actually within the first year of that diagnosis, that they actually do testing for celiac disease. If you have celiac disease on top of type 1 diabetes, your blood sugar management may become very difficult. Um, and so they really need to know that so they can kind of layer on the diet therapy that you need to be able to take care of yourself. Screening and confirmation. I said that's getting better. Um, to be able to do that during the screening process, anybody that's being screened for celiac disease, actually you have to be eating the, the offending substance, the substance that the body sees as an invader that it doesn't like, it's fighting against. You have to have it in your diet, okay, because they do a blood test. Um, and that blood test is going to pick up this particular T tissue transglutaminase, it's an enzyme at the border, it's going to pick that up in the blood test. If you've not been eating the offending substance during that time, it may not give a true reading whether or not you really may potentially have celiac disease. Confirmation and the gold standard is actually biopsy of that bowel. At multiple sites they do a biopsy if you test positive on that blood test and then they look and see if you actually have it within your bowel. They usually test a couple of different sites. You can see by this that why the time period goes on for a while, over 11 years, in terms of diagnosis. Because what would happen is people would often be told when they come in, present with symptoms, and I'm going to show you those, that they have irritable bowel, um, that they have something else going on. And it just goes on and on. People start to actually feel a little crazy, like nobody believes them, that I have things going on. Um, you also notice that they're reporting other things, but typically they weren't associated with that particular part of the bowel. There's other things. This is a systemic disease. It starts in the bowel, but it affects the entire system. So oftentimes something would be happening in another system and nobody put it together with celiac. So it could go on for a long time. Then what happens is the patient or person presents to their physician and says, you know, this has been going on a long time. Somebody has to help me. And they basically tell them, well, maybe you have celiac, so I'm going to test you for that. Being eager to feel better, most people then say, well, what do I have to do if I have celiacs? They say, well, you have to avoid gluten. So immediately, they take gluten out of their diet. They want to feel better right away, okay? Then they go get their blood work. And their blood work shows you don't have a problem. So another few years go by, okay? So you can see the, the vicious cycle that goes on um, when proper, you know, procedures are not followed or communication in terms of what needs to be done for the testing. So, but with increased knowledge like this, that's happening less and less. Okay, so what does it look like? What does a normal bowel look like and what does the um, one with celiac disease look like? I show this to you because it's really important to really understand the implications of celiac disease. A normal bowel, basically, I always think of a hose, but um, it actually has little finger-like projections on it. These are called the villi. You'll see that up there on a normal, healthy villi um, on that bowel. And that provides for the natural, good, healthy absorption and utilization of nutrients, a good, healthy bowel. Just a little bit of gluten, and we'll talk about what's too much and what's, what's a problem, um, creates the disease bowel here on, t on the other side. And when you see that, you can see it's kind of swollen. Uh, the villi projections are becoming lost in the bowel. Um, it just does not look very healthy. When gluten is taken or removed from the diet, the bowel can try, will try to recover from that um, pretty quickly at, at the surface level. Um, that's usually within five days because you have rapid turnover of those cells. So within five days, the surface can heal if the gluten is taken out of the diet. Um, the actual swelling that goes on there, that takes probably about two weeks for the swelling to start to subside. And then it takes two months for normal absorption to start to kick in. It takes six months for those finger-like projections or villi to actually look relatively healthy. And depending on how long the process has been going on, 
it could take up to five years for that bowel to completely heal those VLI. So it can take a long time. So that's important to remember because when I tell you what the treatment is, you have to be able to gauge what that's going to feel like. If you felt bad for a long time, which people usually do, they get accustomed to feeling bad with this disease. If they take it out and they say it's not working, I still have problems, you may just have not gone the course in terms of healing and you got to hang in there a little bit until you can get to that point, right? Because otherwise you might give it up. So it really is important. Um, and I think it's important to remember too, when you get that kind of disruption at the bowel level, you can have other things that are affected. For example, the enzymes that digest milk or milk sugars sit on that brush border of that bowel and are easily disrupted. They're easily disrupted if you have the flu, let alone have celiac disease. So on top of having celiacs, if you've got that process going on, you could have lactose intolerance. You could have other things that you're not digesting well that's giving you all kinds of symptoms that don't make it very comfortable for you. So I say that just so you know, if you, you know, in terms of treatment, you need to be able to pace it in terms of the healing. So this is the other reason why it takes a while to get diagnosed with this disease. If you look at these gastrointestinal symptoms that people can have, bloating, gas, constipation, vomiting, abdominal pain, irritable, and I said irritable bowel, I think I've had many of those all in the same day. <laughs> so in any given day, we all experience these. And so they're just nebulous in terms of really defining celiac disease. They're associated with just everyday life, sometimes something you ate, something you did. So the symptoms are not real specific. They're just kind of general, so it makes it hard. And I told you it was, there was also non-gastrointestinal symptoms, that this is a systemic disease, that it starts at the bowel level, but then it goes off into the rest of the system. People can actually have problems with their teeth. That comes from having poor calcium absorption going on in that bowel, their teeth. Maybe they um, have osteoporosis, osteopenia. That's because you don't have enough calcium. Maybe they're anemic or fatigued. Maybe they, and that comes from poor iron absorption, or maybe a B vitamin, folate, at that brush border. Um, so you can see when the bowel is not absorbing what you need to keep the rest of the body healthy, that there's a whole host of things that could be going on. And someone may never put those together with bowel symptoms. So that's again why the 11 years may go on before somebody starts to put things together for you. Asymptomatic. This is the other piece that makes it really confusing now. If all the other stuff wasn't working in the favor in terms of a diagnosis, this will. If you look at this, 41% of patients with celiac disease, well, that's just 10% or 9% lower than 50% or half the people, don't have symptoms and they have the disease. You're not even having problems, but you have the disease, okay? And it's not because it's latent, meaning it just hasn't developed, but you're carrying it genetically. You just don't have the symptoms. So if you don't have symptoms, typically you don't think there's anything wrong. Um, and that's a little bit higher in the pediatric population. So it really makes it even more difficult. Um, it makes it difficult as we start to talk about how much gluten can somebody tolerate is acceptable. It changes the definition of that because even a small amount may not produce symptoms, but it may not be good for you. So you can see it, it's pretty, it can get pretty confusing. And I told you the only treatment for celiac disease is a lifelong gluten-free diet. There's no medication you can take. There's no surgery you can have. There's nothing you can do except follow a gluten-free diet. Uh, what does the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics say? Um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is the major professional organizations for professionals um, such as myself, registered dietitians in the field of nutrition. They look at all the research. They do all the evaluation. They decide how strong is that research and what does it say. Basically, when they look at all of that, they have a very strong recommendation meaning, and very important recommendation that there's no doubt that if you have celiac disease, it must be a gluten-free diet. There's no blend in between. Um, a couple years ago, when I see patients in the hospital, they would come in and they say, I tolerate a small amount of gluten. And I go, okay. And we usually say, okay, well, how much can you tolerate? Slice of toast a day. You give them a slice of toast. What we've since learned is that's probably too much and that you may not have symptoms that say you're not, you know, that you're tolerating something, but I'm telling you that the research says that you should not have it. So we, we're very strict at the hospital and we pretty much tell people that um, we're gonna go gluten-free. Um, and we'll talk about that definition. So how much is too much? Too much may be one milligram, a crumb of bread. Maybe too much for some people to actually get that bowel disease going, okay? 
What does the FDA say? Now, this has been going on for a while because it gets a little confusing here. Um, since 2007, the FDA is trying to come up with a definition. What do we, what do we define gluten-free to be? What is it? What can we call that? What's, what's acceptable? Because it pervades the marketplace when you start to look at um, the, the types of foods that are in here because we're basically looking at barley, wheat, and rye. Now I'll show you a whole host of other grains that are in there as well. But what are we really talking about? So basically the FDA started in 2007 and is trying to come up with a definition for that. And part of the definition is that the food can't contain any of those prohibited grains that I mentioned. Can't have any wheat, rye, or barley in them. Um, in addition to that, if the food has been processed to remove those grain, those parts of that gluten out of the food, it has to have less than 20 parts per million. Okay, that's their definition. Um, and gluten-free cannot be used on products that are naturally uh, void of gluten unless they say all these products are like that. For example, milk. Milk doesn't have gluten in it. So if they want to, if marketers are often kind of creative, they try to get people to buy some of their products by putting things on them. Years ago, it was peanut butter. If I say this peanut butter has no cholesterol, people will buy it because they're interested in having no cholesterol. Guess what? No peanut butter has cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol only comes from things that have a liver, and, and peanuts don't come from anything that has a liver. They don't have a mom. There is no cholesterol in peanuts, but people would maybe pick that off the shelf. So they can't do that with gluten as well. They can't take a product that doesn't naturally have gluten and say gluten-free because none of it has it, just like milk, okay? So that's part of their definition. So now here it is, less than 20 parts per million. I just told you that a crumb, one milligram or one little part per million could be a problem. So here's the debate that goes between, um, you know, organizations for celiac and the government in terms of what the definition will be, what is going to be safe. There is a study that shows that they've looked at that, well, it's the usual intake. Let's say we tell people have gluten-free um, and they pick some products that say gluten-free on them and, they, and of course there's trace amounts either from cross-contamination or in the processing, you know, they didn't get all of it out because there's no test that says for 100% something's gluten-free. They don't have a perfect test. So what, what would people usually get if they were doing that? Well, they usually get maybe three to six milligrams. Okay, well that's parts per million parts per million, that's well below the 20, okay? And they didn't really see in the studies problems until they got up over 10. So they feel comfortable that that's okay. But if you're the person that can't tolerate one milligram, maybe it's not okay. So there's still that issue. They're hoping to make a decision on this and get this, get this out this year. Um, but like I said, this was introduced in 2007 and each year that I've taught this class, I keep saying we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. So I don't know, waiting for more research, waiting to get to a point where people are all comfortable, but this is what the um, government has proposed. Labeling, labeling can be really confusing. I told you we're gonna have to figure out how to identify gluten in the food chain. How do we find it? Um, you gotta be careful, because you can get confused by some things. Food allergen labeling and the Consumer Protection Act says that food companies must put the top eight allergens on foods when they're containing them one of the top eight allergens is wheat, okay? So it'll say that on a package. You may see something that says it has no wheat, but just because it has no wheat does not mean that it may not have other things that you cannot have, um, like the barley or the rye. Um, the barley is a common flavoring agent. It's often put in a lot of foods. It's malt barley, it flavors just about anything. It can be a natural flavoring in foods. So you can't get f confused between a food allergy and actually finding whether it's not or has whether or not it has gluten. Um, there is no threshold either. When they say something has no wheat, there really is we don't have definitions for how much of something can be in something if you're allergic to it. There isn't anything defined. So and we're still waiting for the federal regulation like I mentioned to you. So be careful when you pick things up. Don't take them and say just because it says no wheat, this must be for me. That's a common um, thing that people will do. So read on the ingredient label, make sure you're checking the ingredients, looking for um, the rye, barley, and if you look in the second bullet point there, you'll see that um, ale, beer, bran, brewer's yeast, which comes from processing of beer, which may then have um, part barley or wheat in it, um, in addition to brown rice cereal, malts and flavorings, all those things you're gonna be looking for in that ingredient list on that label. If you don't see any of those words, it's likely to be gluten-free. If you're not sure, 
it's best to maybe check the website out for the food product or maybe even give the food company a call. Um, all of the foods that we serve here at the hospital, um, I don't know how many calls we place to R&D departments of food companies to ask them questions to make sure all the way back to where the food is processed because at one point there was a juice that we were considering bringing in. We called the company to ask them. We figured it was gluten free because fruit shouldn't have gluten in it. We called the company and they said, well, it's processed in a factory next to waffles. We said, well, we'll get a different juice. So it goes that deep in terms of, you know, trying to look at things and make sure that you're getting things. Oftentimes, websites are pretty helpful for companies. You, you know, and if you don't have a computer, I just suggest give them a call if you're concerned about something um, in terms of what it has. Um, there is a label that they can put onto foods. I have that up there um, in terms of being gluten-free. Um, and remember, there's no technical definition behind that label yet. They're just kind of getting it out there. Um, and then remember to check other products, your toothpaste, your vitamins, um, and medications. If you take medications, talk to the pharmacist. Talk to your pharmacist. Ask them if you're over-the-counter meds or any other medications you take. Gluten is often used as a filler in medications and in vitamins and whatever. So you want to make sure you talk to your pharmacist um, and see if there's any gluten in any of your medications. Here at the hospital, we work really closely with the pharmacist to make sure that we don't have that for our patients. So I told you, I gave you the basics. It's easy to remember wheat, rye, and barley, but the list is longer because there's lots of different kinds of grains, and these are all the grains that you would avoid. If you saw these on the label, these were the ones that you would stay away from. Um, wheat, rye, barley, bulgur, there's quite an extensive list. Okay, the good news is these are all the ones that are okay. There's just as many, it seems, that are okay for you to have. Um, and I would mention on here, you'll notice I'm going to point out the rice on there. Just take a note of that. It is on the gluten-free grains and starch list. So take a note. So is this gluten-free? Okay. These Rice Krispies, on first check, look like they were on the gluten-free list because they say rice. When you read the ingredient label, it says malt flavoring. Okay. So this is not a product that would be acceptable. Okay. And oftentimes when we interview patients, this is the one thing they said they were eating. I eat Rice Krispies. And these Rice Krispies, and I said, you can't eat those Rice Krispies. You need different Rice Krispies. Um, the other thing about this is you want to check out, I would suggest looking at your cereals and see if they have the gluten-free label or say they are gluten-free. Um, it is not uncommon for cereal processing companies to process them on the same belt. So the Wheaties are going right down ahead of your Rice Krispies or whatever product you may have. So um, just check it out. This is a great product. Um, but if you have celiac disease, it wouldn't be the product you'd probably consider at this point, okay? Oat controversy. When I was in school, a long time ago, um, we learned that wheat, rye, barley, and oats are what you avoid when you have celiac disease. Since then, the research has kind of moved ahead, and they basically found that the prolamine, or that structural protein that's in the oats, is really a distant relative and probably really not causing the problems that we thought and really the root cause of why oats are not safe to eat are because they get contaminated in the factories. So again, if you're picking oats, you want to be able to pick those that say gluten-free on them, as these do. And this is just one a brand here. I think it's Red Mill rolled oats that are gluten-free, but there's a lot of oats out there that are gluten-free. And again, this is a major recommendation from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. It's a little conditional. They're a little on the fence. This isn't as strong a recommendation as the first one I presented to you. The only reason why they're on the fence is, oh, it's still a distant relative of some of those other types of um, structural protein. So we're going to hold out. The research, you know, thinks it's the contamination. So we're going to say it's conditional, but we're going to say this. We're going to say if you're just newly diagnosed with celiac disease in the first year or so, just take the oats out. Don't have them, okay? Just try to stay away from them. Long term, um, work them in. It'll probably be acceptable on a small amount, more than 50 grams, that you could have oat, the oats, okay? And what's 50 grams? 50 grams is a half a cup of regular rolled oats or maybe a quarter cup of steel cut oats. And the steel cut are a little hardier, so it's a little bit less of those. So once you, compliance with a gluten-free diet, which is, you know, is not simple, um, improves when people usually are allowed to have oats in their diet. So after the first year, they usually say, we'll go ahead and say you can have them, but just have them in a limited amount. The gluten-free diet, I want to 
focus a little bit on the positive here. There's plenty of foods that are just naturally gluten-free. Um, plain meats, your poultry, anything that's just kind of natural out of nature that is not a grain is going to be okay. Fish, eggs, milk, frozen vegetables, fresh vegetables, um, nuts, plain nuts, seeds, beans, all of those things naturally um, are just going to be gluten-free. They're a good basis and backbone of a healthy diet for people with celiac disease. Uh, you also may then take single ingredient gluten-free products and not, what I'm talking about here are foods like the cereals that I talked about, so single ingredient things that are gluten-free, uh, rice uh, krispies that are a gluten-free version of that. So look at those types of single ingredient grains that are glu labeled gluten-free. And then we talked about the oats, the gluten-free oats and any other processed foods. In the processing, they remove, if they've been processed and it's been removed, it's okay. Um, it's not really technically gluten-free because there's no real pure test, like I mentioned, but it is low enough um, that you probably can go ahead and go with those gluten-free products. Um, and then anything that's just naturally processed that would be gluten-free, we talked about that. Milk, ice cream, yogurt, things like that. They're processed. They have multiple ingredients, but they don't have any gluten in them. Okay? So those would be good as well. You only becomes a problem with these foods when you start to add sauces, when you start to add gravies, when you start to bread your meats, um, when you get things, you know, breaded or, you know, those kinds of stuff, or add, you know, dressings that would then have gluten in them as well. And gluten where you might least expect it. And I already told you it could be in your makeup, could be in your medication, it could be in your um, vitamins, it could be uh, also in... Uh, it could also be in the glue on your envelope, okay? So they used to tell, and I don't know if this has changed, but years ago we'd tell people, if you're going to close your envelope, don't lick it. Just use a little wet sponge. Don't lick the glue because the glue has gluten in it. Um, I'm not sure if they've changed that yet, but we used to say that. Um, so you can see there's a lot of things that are hidden sources of it. Um, mostly they're all processed types of foods. There's candies and stuff, obviously pastas, uh, vinegars. Um, types of vinegars that have not been maybe distilled. There's a little controversy on that. Salad dressing, soy sauce, um, mostly packaged in those dressings and things are the ones that you want to be careful with. You really do want to focus on when you're shopping those that say they are gluten-free um, particularly. There are gluten-free specialty things. This has really changed um, years ago. The specialty foods. Years ago, it was really hard for people with celiac disease. It was really a difficult diet, oftentimes, you know, just not very com you know, comfortable to be on or very good. Um, right now, the marketplace has really expanded. They're really smart. They're ahead of everybody because they know that the research says there might be a tenfold increase in people who have celiac disease. And what do those people need? They need gluten-free foods, and so we're going to manufacture those and make more acceptable products for them, make things available to them. In addition to that, what's going on right now that we see in the hospital is that um, there's always some villain. There's always a food villain, okay? For a while it was, you know, oh, I don't know, uh, foods with cholesterol in it. That's a food villain. And it moves around. Uh, trans fat, common food villain. Nobody has those in there anywhere anymore. We've taken them out here at the hospital. But right now the food villain seems to be gluten. And it's not just because of celiac disease. It's for a whole host of other things that people have said it helps with. Helps with belly fat. Helps with um, just about anything, um, but not necessarily anything related to celiac disease. So there's a whole host of people that are kind of falling gluten-free, but not because they're celiac, because that seems to be the food villain right now, or one of them. Sugar, sugar beverages is another one that's, that's kind of a food villain um, as well. So the good news is that because of the markets responding to everybody wanting it, they have stuff available. The products tend to be more expensive, so it's a little more expensive. And I haven't checked of late, um, because the laws always seem to be changing, but at one point, if you were definitely a celiac who needed these products, you could then use it as a deduction on your tax, as long as you got you know, documentation from your doctor that indeed that this was a part of your therapeutic prescription part of a diet that you had to follow. Um, so that would be something worth checking into. Okay, the, I only mentioned this. I put the comparison of carbohydrates up here. And the only reason why I put this up here is that I go back to when I mentioned that type 1 diabetics sometimes commonly have celiac disease. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, you're typically looking at the types 
of carbohydrates or starches that are in your diet for blood sugar management. So across the board, when you start to look at these specialty foods, if you have diabetes and celiac disease, it's a little bit harder for you because those products tend to be higher in carbohydrates. And you can see that up here on this chart, the carbohydrate difference between a regular product and the higher level in those that are gluten-free. Um, gluten-free products also tend to be lower in fiber. They also tend to be higher in fat. The fats added by the companies, they're just trying to make it more palatable. So usually fat gets thrown in to the product. So you want to be careful when you're looking at products to look and see how much total fat's in there as well um, for your health. I mentioned nutritional issues because we said when the bowel gets affected like that, it's the pipeline to the whole system in terms of what nutrients are going to be affected. I mentioned fiber's oftentimes low in this diet because it's just literally removed from many of the grains. Calcium and vitamin D may not be absorbed. Well, all the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, including iron. I said often iron. People may be anemic. Um, the folate. The folate works with iron to make red blood cells. So if your folate is low or having problems with absorption of folate, it's very common then to have the anemia. And then the two other B vitamins, riboflavin and niacin, those are because those are B vitamins often found in grains. And when those are disrupted or taken out of the diet or changed, oftentimes those become low in the diet as well. And then magnesium and phosphorus. So what's recommended when people are first diagnosed with celiac disease and then on an ongoing basis after you've spoken with your doctor or registered dietitian, at least initially, you may take a broad spectrum, low dose multivitamin just to cover your basis. Um, they know that the disease has been going on, you've been diagnosed with it, let's cover the basis. They also may do some tests to look at these vitamins, test and see or the levels in your uh, levels that you have, your iron and stuff, to make sure that if there's any additional um, iron you need, calcium or vitamin D, that they actually um, get that to you as well. But initially, most people just have a low spectrum, broad dose. Uh, vitamin that they take in the beginning. Okay, so what else do you need to know? You need to know you need to look at, um, you know, the ingredients on the labels. You need to be careful about, you know, whether it's an allergy for wheat for, versus actually identifying foods that have gluten in them. The other thing that's very important and one of the recommendations as imperative is that you need to really take a look at and be aware of cross-contamination, okay? So how do your foods maybe get contaminated with those parts of other foods that have gluten in them? Well, we talked about that. We know that if it gets processed in the factory and it's going on a belt with other cereal, it's going to get contaminated. So that's one way. So all the way from the field to your plate, there's opportunity for those foods to come in contact in storage, um, in processing, contact services where it's prepared. Um, can it unintentionally have gluten added to it? So you need to be careful about that. At home, you want to make sure you have a dedicated area. If you have gluten-free and gluten foods, have an area where you just pro handle or put together your gluten-free foods. Separate countertops, specific areas, clean them with a separate rag. Don't, you know, move stuff back and forth. Uh, have dedicated storage areas, usually higher. You want to be above it, so if anything drops out, the things that have gluten, if you drop something below, it doesn't end up on top of your gluten-free products or separate them into separate cupboards, do something like that. You also want to have, you know, dedicated cooking equipment, um, non-porous or non, you know, stick pans and those kinds of things where the non-stick pans develop those little cracks in them sometimes over time when you're, you know, cooking in them, they start to break down, and in those crevices, Gluten, just little parts of gluten. When I said a breadcrumb could be a problem, parts of breading or other things that have been in that pan can stick down in there. So you want to make sure you have dedicated cookware and things that you use for that. Um, we have that here at the hospital. We also have dedicated serviceware that we use. Um, we have a dedicated toaster. So their toaster for our gluten-free patients is in a separate part of our kitchen. It's not near our tray line. Um, it is covered at all times when it's not in use. And I say that because in food preparation, when you're working with flour, we work with flour in our kitchen, um, flour can actually, you know how you kind of you scoop it out and there's like a poof, which you don't like, it ends up all over you, but there's a little cloud of flour? Well, that sprays little particulates of fiber in the air. 
You may not see them, but they're hanging out there for about 24 hours, settling on surface areas, okay? So when our toaster's not in use, we keep it covered. We don't have it open because we don't want anything floating around that can settle on our surface areas or our areas where we prepare food for our patients. So same thing at home. If you're gonna use a toaster, don't put regular toast in there and, and gluten-free toast as well. Have dedicated um, types of equipment for that. In addition, sometimes it's just easier to get squeeze bottles of things or individual packets. We do that here a lot at the hospitals, little packets of mayonnaise or little things where, you know, if, if somebody's making a sandwich on regular bread and they're dipping in your mayonnaise and then putting it on their bread and then dipping back and you're dipping in, then, whoops, then you're cross-contaminating. So we really kind of, squeeze bottles are great because nobody puts anything in there. Little individual packets work great so there isn't any cross-contamination um, going on there as well. So you really have to kind of, you know, look at how you're handling your foods and doing that. I would suggest when you go out, and I won't mention names in terms of restaurants, I think restaurants are trying to do a nice job of meeting the needs of people with celiac disease. Oftentimes they have a gluten-free menu. Um, there's one place in particular that I know makes pizza. I don't know where they put the pizza that's separate from the other pizza. It's great that you have a gluten-free bread dough, but I don't know where it goes. I have never seen anything separate. Um, and I'll tell you a little story. I was out, my sister-in-law has celiac disease. Uh, we were out having dinner at a restaurant, and she said, I'll have a green salad, no croutons, please, just salad, and no dressing. She brought her own dressing. So the salad came out and had croutons on it. So she says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't have the croutons. Could you take them? You know, I need a new salad. I need a new one. So it came back, but the breadcrumbs the, from the croutons were still on the salad. So they just took them off, and now it's contaminated. So she just kindly said, I'll pass, um, because it was too difficult to explain to the server why she could not have that salad. So when you're eating out, just be careful. I think the, the knowledge base in restaurants, they're doing a great job absolutely great job providing you things, but there's still, everybody's learning about this at the same time. Um, I'll move that over. So everybody's learning at the same time, so just keep be aware when you're out there. Um, I think they all intend to do the absolute best, but um, still need to be educated. So I'm gonna give you a little resources here, and then I'm gonna entertain questions, but these are some great references um, that are reliable, the NIH, um, the Evidence Library, which is from the, the, uh, the academy that I spoke of, that, is the professionals in nutrition, um, and then the University of Maryland is another one that I'm particularly fond of. Uh, these are support groups, if you're not aware of some of the support groups. The other one that I really like that you'll find, I think, really helpful in terms of going in depth, more depth, it's difficult to really spend a lot of time on label reading and really doing that, and that's why it's suggested that when patients are first or people are first diagnosed with celiac disease, that they actually get, they get in to see a dietitian right away. It does not make sense to have a disease that the only treatment is the diet and not see a registered dietitian. So, um, but it, to take you a little further, if you would like to look in that, Tricia Thompson's website is excellent. I think you'll find a lot of help there in terms of identifying products and lists of things that are acceptable for you to have. Make it a little easier for you. Um, these are just some publications used today. Um, are there any questions and comments that I can entertain? Uh, it is true to assume now that not all gluten-frees are celiacs true. and that I'm wondering what the difference is in the carefulness for those that are not celiacs but have an intolerance. Uh, it, how uh, big a deal is that? Um, that's an excellent question. And actually, yes, there's a whole, there's a whole constellation of people here interested in, in um, gluten. There's the people who, what I call on the bandwagon, um, that are against the food, it's the, it's the villain, so they're, they're doing it for reasons that, um, of their own. There's people with legitimate celiac disease who really need to be very careful. And then there's people who kind of have an allergy. They have an allergy to gluten. They don't have a genetic inherited, you know, disorder, an autoimmune disorder, which is systemic. They basically have an allergy, like you might have an allergy to milk protein. And you develop a runny nose and this and that, but you're not doing the systemic damage and everything at that level. So. There's degrees of people doing it for very good, you know, reasons or reasons of their own. Will a dishwasher decontaminate all the utilities and the pots and pans that we use? Uh, 
It should. It should. But if you have, like I said, if you have old kind of uh, equipment in disrepair and stuff like that, you probably should just get something fresh. One of the things sometimes we do here at the hospital, it's a quick and easy way if you're like trying to get something done and maybe your dishes are dirty or whatever, we have heavy duty aluminum foil and sometimes we will bake the fish or something, you know, just braise it or do whatever we do with it and we just get heavy duty aluminum foil because it's one time, you know, we don't do it often, but sometimes there'll be something that we need to get to a patient you know, right away. And so we just kind of use heavy duty aluminum foil and that's actually perfect to do at home if you want to as well. I, I'm the matriarch of three generations of celiac. Uh -huh. And I know that Stanford University was working on a pill that you could pop before you went out to eat. Do you have any more information on that? I don't, but I'm gonna look into that. That would be a good idea. Um, I guess, but I'm trying to think how would it work, what would be the pathophysiology of that? Because what happens is those amino acid structures, when they come in contact with the barrier of the intestine, actually interact with that transglutamase that we talked about and actually start to deaminate the proteins and change them so that they're kind of slipping through the bowel and creating that damage. So what would the pill do? I guess stop that. I guess stop that. And I don't know how you would shut that down, but that's interesting. Yeah, that might be difficult to do, but I'll look into it. You mentioned the TTG testing. Mm -hmm. I, I've been diagnosed celiac six years ago, and I'm concerned about my children. They're in their 20s. Mm -hmm. Would that be the type of testing that they should have done periodically, like maybe every five years? You know what, I would see, I would just see their pediatrician, if they're children, I would see their doctor and ask them what they suggest. There's a lot of, it's a slippery slope when it comes to what do you know, what do you do if somebody's latent? That means they haven't presented with the disease, but they're carrying it. So what do you do? Do you just automatically start saying, hey, you're on gluten-free full bore, or do you wait? So, um, you know, and then knowing what, up to 60% of pediatric patients don't even present or something, if you remember back the statistics, in terms of being asymptomatic. So I think I would talk to my physician on that and ask them what they suggest that they do, because they're children and, you know, their growing is important and, you know, puberty and everything else, so I would check with them. I, I do have a, <clears throat> a question. I live in Merrill Gardens and all my meals are in the dining room, <clears throat> and the dining room chef takes his orders from the headquarters in Seattle. So we residents have very little input to the actual meals. I mean, we can uh, request maybe certain vegetables or certain dishes at certain times. But in terms of dietary restrictions and things, there's very little attention paid to that. Do you have any recommendations of, um, of what, what we can do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned to live with it for four years, and I am gluten, I'm celiac, but um, do you have any recommendations? Well, what I would say is typically knowledge is power. So the more you know, the more you, you know, the more you're required to do, and that when you know something, then, you know, you should do something. So that's why, like here in the hospital, I spent a lot of time educating nurses and pharmacists and stuff about this diet so everybody's on the same page. So it um, sounds like, you know, a little education might work there to help people. Yeah. Um, to understand what's going on, yeah. Kimberly, for those who want to cook at home, do you recommend any particular cookbooks? Hmm. You know, I have I, I haven't stumbled upon one in particular. I have I have one in my office, but I'm not. I don't know that it's any better than anything else. I think that. Um, gosh, I wish I could. I would check out again Trisha the RD's website. I think she probably has recipes on there. I think I've seen them. Um, that's a good place to maybe get started um, with that. Earlier in your lecture you said some of the celiac people have um, deficiencies on certain vitamins. Is there a specific blood test we should ask our doctor for? Um, no, you know what, I think case by case basis and I probably would see them and depending on symptoms or things that you have that they will make a decision on which ones, what they want to look at. You know, I mean if you're anemic and they see that in your blood then they may want to check your iron levels or um, folate or whatnot. So I think it's case by case, depending on how you present and what it is that they're going to decide to look for. I think they sh they're probably monitoring that and doing that for a celiac patient anyway. Okay. Great questions. Brilliant questions. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Our community is very curious and knowledgeable. They are. They yeah. are. Well, Kimberly, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Really, this was thank amazing. You. Yeah, thank you.